Hi, this is Irving Steele, your host of Local Issues. And today we are really excited to have a local author, speaker, job coach, and entrepreneur here with us today. So Jean, welcome to the show. How are you? Very good. Thanks for having me. Of course. And you're quite the accomplished author. You have three books already that are published. Is that right? That is right. Yes. Okay. So I'm curious, why writing? How did you kind of get started in writing and in this specific area? Well, really, the writing part, I had no choice. My um, father was a writer. My sister is a writer. My grandfather was a writer. It's just in the family. Mm -hmm. So I just followed along. And um, really, in about seventh grade, I fell in love with poetry and writing poetry. And I still write and get poems published. And in fact, I was um, won first prize by the Mystic Seaport for a poem about the Mystic River this past fall. Um, but then, you know, getting a book published is a hard thing, and I was writing um, fiction and uh, getting very frustrated because I couldn't get a book published, and a friend in publishing said to me, well, but you're a career coach. Why don't you write about the work you do helping people find work? So that's how the first book was born. Mm -hmm. Great, and so it's something that pretty much everyone throughout their lives, at one point or another, you'll be <clears throat> maybe putting together a resume, maybe you'll be looking for a job, maybe going through an interview, and so it's something applicable to pretty much everyone at one point or another in their life. That's Is that right. kind of what you see? Yes, yeah, I mean, it's wonderful skills to have, and I think they should be part of, I think career skills should be part of high school and college curriculums, mm -hmm. and of course... Colleges do have career development offices that help students, but um, there's you just never know. And even if you're in a job that's a really good job and it feels stable, it's smart to know how to search for work. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and it's something that pretty much <coughs> every state throughout the country, people are hired at will. And so no matter what, if you look at someone the wrong way or if for whatever reason, there doesn't need to be a reason, you can be eliminated. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, I was with my last firm for 16 years, and then one day um, I sort of knew it was coming. I intuited that it was coming, and uh, and when I saw my boss standing outside my office door, I said, okay, this is it. And, and you know, they, thank you, Jean. You've done wonderful work, and goodbye. It's it just what happens, and it just felt particularly ironic being a career coach to have to uh, counsel myself. Mm -hmm. But as one of my clients said, um, Jean, read your book. Read your own book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which easier said than done. Yeah. Sometimes we have this advice or we have this knowledge, but for us to listen to our own advice or the great knowledge that you have in your book, it's sometimes easier said than done. It is easier said than done. Yeah, I, I, I had a little mild temper tantrum. It didn't last me too long. And uh, I was lucky because just at the point where I was let go was when I um, had decided to have my first dog certified as a therapy dog. So I had this mm -hmm. wonderful volunteer work open up just at that point where I lost my job. Perfect. <clears throat> and then we moved from Pennsylvania to Connecticut. So um, uh, that helped me really become part of a community. And then um, I found other work. I worked for the, the state for uh, Connect what was then called Connecticut Works. Now it's called American Job Centers. Mm -hmm. Really, basically. Out of Montville. Yeah. It okay. wasn't Montville then. It was New London, Norwich, okay. Willimantic, and Danielson. So I was all over helping. Mm -hmm. um, people who were out of work. Mm -hmm. That's great. And maybe we could touch upon a little <coughs> bit that when you're eliminated, your first book, Eliminated Now What? That was your first one, right? Yes. That so much of our identity sometimes is associated or connected to kind of our job or our <coughs> career. So you said, you know, 16 years, you're working, it's who you <coughs> are. You, so much in American culture, we introduce ourselves. Hey, this is who I am. And this is what I do. It's maybe one of the first few questions when you're meeting somebody. That's right. And so there's a huge emotional element as well that you're eliminated first. Yeah, now what? How do you pay your bills? How do you pay rent and food? But also emotionally, how do you kind of take care of yourself to move forward in that next step? Yes, yes. And that was one of the really the key things that I really tried to do with the clients, the thousands of clients that I counseled over 20 years as a career coach was mm -hmm. Was, was to help them see that although they had lost their jobs, they hadn't lost their talents. They hadn't mm -hmm. lost who they were. They hadn't lost their abilities. And that they really needed to own them. Mm -hmm. Those were theirs, and mine were mine. You know, and so mm -hmm. to get back on that. Uh, but I had one client I will never forget who was so distraught 
mm -hmm. that he just, uh, I really worried about him. And um, he, he didn't want to network and he just kept applying for jobs online and nothing happened mm -hmm. and he got more and more panicked. Um, but finally, out of pain, he did begin to network and then things opened up and he got a new job. And, you know, I, I, my last words to him was, remember, you know, remember you owned your skills. Mm -hmm. That's great. You own the skills and yeah. you go through that experience, like you said, maybe you closed down, but the way so many people, I'm sure you saw that the thousands of the people you've helped, you find it through maybe networking, going to different events, let's say, the governor was speaking in New London today. Maybe you go there and you meet somebody. You never know, right? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, very rarely is a job search a straight line. Mm -hmm. so, sometimes it is. So, you know, if you were a physician or maybe an engineer, you you might, or an accountant, you might be able to go from one job this way and then right to the next job, and it would be pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But for many of us, especially if there's career change or um, other changes like location, um, or salary, th then then it's a little harder. Mm -hmm. And over the thousands of people that you helped through the American Job Center and your own personal clients and other friends and family you've helped, what have you kind of noticed as some trends that really help people during this process to stand out, to kind of move forward in that next step? Well, I worked for a major outplacement firm, okay. Lee Heck Harrison. That was the last 16 years of, of that work. and. Um, and they were wonderful and they had very good resources. And so part of what you have to learn is that looking for work is a job mm -hmm. and it's a full-time job. So if you, the Department of Labor did this study way back in the 70s and they asked a whole number of people who were in transition, notice I don't say out of work, I say in transition. Mm -hmm. And they said, um, well, how much time are you spending on your job search? And these were people who had worked full time. Mm -hmm. And they got answers ranging from three hours, maybe seven hours a week. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then they were surprised that they were still out of work. Mm -hmm. So in my work, part of what I try to teach people is this is a job you need to be organized, you need to, you need to diversify your efforts, but you also need to put in enough effort and, mm -hmm. and work at it that you're gonna get results back. Mm -hmm. Because if you do it in dribs and drabs and then nothing happens, then you're really discouraged. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to keep going, where if you put more into it and then things start coming back and you diversify your search, so you're, you're networking and you're answering ads and you're working with recruiters and maybe employment agencies and you're targeting companies directly, all the different ways you can do it, mm -hmm. then you pay, start to pay attention. Well, where am I getting some traction? Mm -hmm. who's, who's calling me back? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the saddest thing that, that always gets me is when, when um, during times, especially when the economy is difficult, like in 2008, mm -hmm. and people are out of work and they're interviewed and they say, what are you doing? Well, I'm answering ads online. How many have you answered? Well, 357. Um, and, and what's happened so far? Nothing. Um, well, what are you going to do next? Answer some more ads. No. No. If it's not working, you have to change tactics. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find something else. And sure, you can still answer some ads, but maybe you can answer an ad and then also try to find a way to come in the back door of that company mm -hmm. so that you have an advantage over the the slush pile, as they call it, right? Yep. Yeah. Because if you just keep banging your head against the wall, then nothing's going to help you to move to that next step. No, you might pass out. <laughs> yeah, you might pass out. <laughs> and I just saw something the other day, something like I think it was 90% of all hired people, the job wasn't even posted. Correct, correct. So how are these people navigating that process? Because many people think, oh, go look for a job, apply, send in the resume through LinkedIn, Indeed, ZipRecruiter, all these different right. technologies. right, right. But most people aren't finding their job that way. Tell us more about that. Well, the unpublished job market is big, mm -hmm. and no one knows, and certainly I don't know, how yeah. big it is. Now, back in my outplacement days, we used to say it was about 50-50, so about 50% published, 50% unpublished. But uh, no one really knows. Mm -hmm. What we do know is there's a lot of unpublished jobs out there, and often they're the better jobs mm -hmm. because if you you know, are trying to get to the next step as an engineer or as a... Um, 
I don't know, accountant or anything, you, you're, you're better off talking to people who then see the value that you have and see where, not only where you are, but where you can go. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. That's why it's so important to diversify your search so that you're tapping into that unpublished job market as well as the published one. Mm -hmm. Because really, um, you don't know. Career coaches don't know. Mm -hmm. we, we sound like we know. We don't know. <laughs> you know? I'm sure every situation is a little unique, a it little is. different, too. It is. It is. Yeah. But, uh, but if you run a diversified search, then you find out. And so, you know, I used to push people pretty hard to what I call target uh, individuals. So let's say, you know, I wanted to work um, for the Mystic Aquarium. Mm -hmm. You know, I would find out, and let's say I wanted to work in HR, then I would find out, well, who's the head of HR there? Mm -hmm. And instead of waiting for a posting, I might write to that person, send them an email, um, showing that I know some of the challenges they have mm -hmm. and how I might be able to help. No resume. Mm -mm. So the resume too soon is, a, is kind of a death, you know, a, a death note. And people are like, ah, no, I don't, I don't want that. But just a short email. So, so that's a way to get yourself in the door and, and of course, a referral is even better. An introduction uh, from a friend or wonderful. a common person. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you talk to so and so? You know, they understand you may not have anything, but just they're they're in a job search. They're talking to people, and they'd find it very helpful. Do you have ten minutes? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. And what we're seeing, at least in the macro economy right now, is you know Dow Jones and S and P five hundred. The stock market is hitting record highs, it, according to recent job reports. It seems like unemployment is relatively low throughout the country right now yeah and it sounds like for a lot of people if they want to be working they can find a suitable role for their skills and talents what are you hearing or thinking from kind of the general economy right now i don't know the answer to that because i'm not actively really doing career coaching okay. now so i couldn't give you um one i would just say that the economy can do well and you could have a rough search. Mm -hmm. The economy could do poorly and you could have a great search. Mm -hmm. It's it's weird, I mean, because you only need one job. So, um, I mean, one of the things that used to drive me nuts as a career coach was summertime because everyone decided, since we're programmed as school children, yep. uh, well, summertime is beach time, right? And then that means you couldn't possibly get hired over the summer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, actually you could. And, and the people who are working their search over the summer are definitely going to be the ones getting hired in September, even if the hiring didn't happen in July and August. But lots of times it does. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to kind of swim against the current sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely depends. The, the economy can be good, the economy can be bad. But I think, like you said, having the right strategy and going forward with that. And then... Also, you said kind of looking at some of your progress as well, keeping track of how you're applying to the jobs, how you're networking. So then I guess mentally you can continue to feel like you're making momentum towards that one job that you really want to have. Yeah, and in a funny way, it's very much like getting a book published yep. because, um, you know, traditionally if you ask someone, well, how do I get a book published? They'll say, well, you need a literary agent. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. I've had three. Three um, different literary agents. Yeah. The first one was fantastic. Okay. Um, had nothing to do with these books. This was before. Um, got, we got, helped me get close, pretty close, mm -hmm. um, but no cigar on that, that one. And then um, the second one was a disaster. I'm not even going to talk about that one. And the third one was worse. So, so then I had to figure out, well, then how do I get a book published? Mm -hmm. Well, I needed to know once I decided what I was going to write about, and when I decided I was going to write a career book, well, how do I do it? I had to learn how to write a proposal. I had a friend at the company I worked for who had written a book, so he helped me. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, and you came up with the proposal before you went ahead and wrote the book. Yeah, I had written a little bit of the book. With nonfiction, you don't have to write the whole book. With yeah. fiction, you do. Um, with poetry, nobody wants it, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 Just really. Um, but then he knew somebody who wanted to interview career coaches who were also parents. Mm -hmm. And since I happened to be a parent, mm -hmm. um, this woman in Baltimore interviewed me. She was wonderful. I loved her. She, she was great. Um, 
and she was writing a book called All Moms Work, mm -hmm. and which has done very well, helping women with that eternal balance of work mm -hmm. and kids. And um, she said to me, well, why don't you try GIST? And GIST is the publisher who, within a week, I had an offer. Wow, tell us more about that. That's incredible. A it was, week you had an offer for your well, book. Well, uh, yeah, because I had worked on the proposal with it. You with had it ready. Help, uh, yeah, I had written this stuff. I had outline of the chapters. It wasn't all written. And um, she said, try this this wonderful editor at GIST. Uh, her name is Laurie Kate's Hand. I'll never forget it. She's wonderful. We're still in touch. And um, I thought, oh, you know, here we go. Mm -hmm. This is going to be just like the agents and nothing will happen. And a few days later, I got a nice email saying, we're, we're looking at this, but I have to wait for our editorial board to meet. And I'm thinking, well, that'll be three or four months. Mm -hmm. And then a few days later, um, I get an email, Jean, we wanted to publish your book. Wow, awesome. amazing. Yeah, and she was a peach to work with, just great, mm -hmm. really great. So um, we've stayed in touch and then, and then they asked for a book about interviewing. So I worked on the second book, but then, the company got bought out, big changes, Laurie left, you mm -hmm. know, I lost my, lost my buddy. So yeah. um, they said they didn't want it. So I called my friend who had helped me with the first book, mm -hmm. my, uh, my friend Orville, and I said, Orville, what should I do? And he said, um, oh, try Career Press. He, his book had been published with Career Press, so I tried Career Press and they published it. Wow. Yeah. That's great. And then with the third book, which is the book about my dog, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with careers except everything has to do with careers, as the Joy Unleashed, um, I read a ton of dog books. Uh -huh. I read about, you know, rescues, because Bella was a, a rescue from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the publishers, and I looked at the editors. So I found one, a book that I really liked, um, which was about dogs from this particular place in Puerto Rico where Bella was from. Mm -hmm. And um, it took me nine months, I, nine months of writing to them and, and saying, come on, come on, how about it? And they finally said yes. Yeah. I think really to make me go away. <laughs> <laughs> but were, it worked. You were persistent on I, that. Yeah, incredibly. Incre you have to be. Yep. You have to be just kind of dumb, dumb stubborn. Um, so that's great, and this book is now in its third printing, is sold over 9,000 copies. So Congratulations. It's out there. That's awesome. And, and the interview book, got that publisher got bought out, and and this book is doing really well in Asia. In Asia, of Go all places. Go figure. Why I do you think that is? I have no clue. I have no clue, but I just think it's wonderful. So I get these little checks in the mail. That's royalties. awesome. It's fun. <laughs> it's a piece of work. That's great. <clears throat> and then connected to that as well, then you can have your name out there that people invite you yeah. as a speaker. Yes. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I, d I decided a number of years ago, I had started my career really as a corporate trainer and I taught presentation skills and I thought, oh, this is fun. And I uh, joined the National Speakers Association for a while mm -hmm. and um, then found myself traveling all over the country giving these talks and thought, oh, this is something. And it was weird, you know, like one industry, once you once you sort of get your toe with, one, so mm -hmm. I, the industry that found me was, associ was the associations of assisted living, hmm. but all over the country, these different associations. I don't know anything about assisted living, but it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, so. What did they want you to talk about? Well, things like burnout and customer service and mm -hmm. presentation skills, the things I could talk about, but, um, so I found myself just zipping around the country doing that. And then one day I was sitting in the airport waiting for my plane. And I thought, um, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Do I want to keep doing this? And I thought, no, I'd really rather be writing books than running around the country giving these talks. So, mm -hmm. so I still do a lot of talks, but mostly now for uh, librarians, library staff. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. I love for you to <clears throat> unpack a little bit kind of your process for writing that yeah. so often we see a book or we have it on our Kindle or some other reading device and I think we underestimate just the amount of sheer work that goes into it. So maybe you can share your process. Do you wake up early and start writing? Do you have different blocks of time? How do you go from the outline, the plan, the proposal 
to a published book like this? Yeah, uh, great question and a lot of pieces to it. So um, I don't know what you consider early. I get up at 7.30. That's early enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not 5 in the morning. And um, so after breakfast and walking the dogs, then um, I'm at my desk all morning. So usually till 12, 12.30, sometimes 1. So I try to get three to four hours of work a day mm -hmm. done. Um, I'm at a point in my career where I don't have to do more, which is dreamy. It's nice. And, and I'm also interested in other things, and I spend a, a fair amount of time volunteering with my dog, which is another topic. Yeah. Um, and are you listening to music? Are you, no, okay, quiet. A quiet spot. Yeah. Um, one dog's on the bed beside my desk. The other dog is under a bed. Mm -hmm. I'm in a spare bedroom upstairs. And all I can see are his little back feet picking, poking out from under the bed. But it cracks me up, and it, I have these two companions. You know, so if I get stuck, I just get up and I pat them or I roll around on the floor <laughs> with them. But um, because I've written poetry and fiction as well as nonfiction, um, I think for me the process always starts with the ear. It always starts with sound. It always starts with... Um, so, so even if you look at, like, at, at the way Eliminated Now What starts, um, let me just read you one sentence. Um, it's called the shock. Um, um, there are almost always signs before you lose your job, but many times you don't see them until after the fact. That's the beginning of a story, mm. right? So, so it's a powerful beginning. Yeah. So that's the way. That's the way. So it's always sound. It's always. Um, I don't really outline things in a in a totally logical, detailed way. But I often have a big picture, like like with this one, eliminated now. What it was easy because, okay, okay, there's job loss, and then there's getting over the shock, and then there's all the pieces, the the, the technical skills like interviewing, networking, mm -hmm. negotiating, um, and then keeping track of your efforts, timekeeping. What do you do when you're discouraged? But what I, what I figured out very quickly with the, that, the first book was I wanted a story in every chapter, mm -hmm. a true story of a real client. And then um, I thought it was even more fun to include something that you should never do. So every chapter has a little thing about things you should never do. Kind for, of a non-example. Yeah, for example. Yeah. For example, a non-example. <laughs> um, and it's funny, I was just talking to my husband about this. To say, to be on oh, to be honest with you, or to be honest with you, Irving. And then you're thinking, oh my gosh, was she lying this whole time? <laughs> yeah. You know, so these these weird little uh, quirks that we can develop. So, um, but these <clears throat> little quirks, if you're in an interview or if you're <clears throat> trying to network, they can make a world of difference. They can, they can, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I made it upbeat, I made it fun, and then the the third thing I did that I really like about this book is I asked a client or former client, someone who had worked with me, who had been through job loss, who who really knew the process from his or her side, mm -hmm. I asked them, would you write a chapter for me? Mm. So because there's three sections of the book, I had three different clients write the end, get the, I call it the final word, mm -hmm. and they got to write what they experienced. And one of them really kind of disagreed with me, and that was fine. I mm -hmm. thought that was awesome, you know? To have a different perspective yeah, in there. Yeah, because he, I mean, he even says, well, these career counselors, they'll tell you, you gotta do this, and you gotta do this, and you gotta do this. And he said, really? Um, the way he got his job was taking people out for coffee. He I, I told him he drank his way to his next job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he took everybody to Starbucks. M let me treat you for coffee, and can I borrow your brain for 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. I, I, it was incredible. It's incredible. And it's something, too, that's very cultural as well. Yeah. As well that yes. maybe in America, that would be a perfect thing. Maybe for your Asian customers buying the book, maybe they do it over lunch or over dinner, over drinks. It really depends. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that was the process, and then the interview book was sort of easier because I looked at different types of interviews. I looked at where people got stuck, mm -hmm. uh, and then I decided to do good, better, and best for each. Uh, there's hundreds of questions in the book, sample mm -hmm. questions. So I did a good answer, I did a better answer, and I did the best answer, but I also explained why. Mm. So, so you could really, just by reading those um, sample questions, you could learn a tremendous amount. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in the book, in the dog book, it was just, you know, it was like our old dog died and then we ended up with this crazy puppy and 
oh my gosh, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so the story kind of took over itself. Um, and then because I had started volunteering a lot at, with the therapy dog in hospitals and schools, I had all these stories from the people that we visit. Mm -hmm. And I'm very careful. I mean, I never reveal who anybody really is, but, mm -hmm. but they're true stories. It seems like an overarching theme for all three of your books and maybe for your future books that you will publish potentially down the road is you have kind of this innate passion to get you started of why. Why do you want to help people? You have all these years of experience helping people find careers and go through yeah. the job interview process. You've had the personal experience with the dog. You have that passion. Yes. And I feel like that probably helps a lot when you're trying to write the yeah, book. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. And the one I'm working on now, which is very exciting. Tell is, us about that. Yeah. It's called, Can a Teacher Have Four De Legs and a Tail? And it's written with a special ed teacher. So it's a, my first time of co-authoring. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, working with a high school special ed teacher in Stonington. And it's a book written for a, what's considered a life skills class, which mm -hmm. is a a type of special ed class where the students are really, the emphasis is not so much academic as it is, how can we help you live independently? Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge for these kids is they're given, the books they can read are not interesting to them. Mm -hmm. They're baby books. They don't like them and they insult them. So they won't read them. So then their reading doesn't get better. So uh, can, can a teacher have four legs and a tail is about Rudy, my current therapy dog, and his experience with the students written from two points of view, the student's point of view and his point of view mm. of, of what happens when he comes into the classroom and how do they interact and what does the girl do who's terrified of dogs mm. and, um, and what does the boy do who doesn't want to speak because he thinks people will make fun of the way he speaks. So we're, we're having a great time uh, working on that. That's awesome. And what is it like as a co-author? Do you send chapters back and forth? Well, really, it, I'm saying co-authoring. I'm writing it. Okay. Which is better because I like to do the writing. And yeah. she's got a full-time job and a, and a young child, so <clears throat> time for writing is not happening to her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but she is a special ed expert. So she has that So knowledge. she's making sure that, we're, that the book is correct and useful. And then she will design all the lesson plans and... Um, and ways the books can be used in the classroom. So resources for teachers. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And it's fun. We just have about a minute left or yes. so. So I wanted to find out if you had any kind of parting or last advice for our viewers, whether they're going through an elimination, going through the job interview process, or if they're trying to write a book themselves. Don't give up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's a, that's a, that's an easy thing to say, but also, um, also change, you know, if, if one tactic isn't working. I mean, uh, Laura, the co my co-author and I tried a, a version of this back before the pandemic and, and shopped it around to a few publishers and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And then I was, this past winter, I was looking at past projects and thinking, you know, I knew there was something there, but we hadn't done a great job on it. And I said to her, do you want to revise this and work on it again? And she said, yeah. So just coming back to things, whether it's job search or a book, um, gives you a fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. But you have to keep at it. Keep at it and ability to change. That's what Darwin said, a sign of intelligence <coughs> is the ability to change. Yes, and it's hard. It is really hard. Really hard. Because you, as a writer, you fall in love with your words. Oh, this is wonderful. This is great. It's done. Uh, probably not. <laughs> 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 and so I'm learning at my uh, uh, advanced age that, you know, to really uh, spend more time letting things evolve. Thank you. It's fun.